Okay. Good afternoon. Welcome to the World Meteorological Day. Bonjour et bienvenue à tous à la Journée Météorologique Mondiale. Je suis Abdoulaye Harou, chef de la division de traitement des données et du système de prévision à l'OMM. Et j'ai le grand privilège d'agir comme votre maître de cérémonie pour cette célébration. Secretary General of the World Meteorological Organization, Petri Talas, Ms. Jill Peters, Professor Peter Hopper, Director General of the United Nations Office at Geneva, Ms. Michael Muller, Excellencies, Representative of Member Countries, Ladies and Gentlemen, Dear Colleagues. Before we start, I would like to inform you that interpretation is available in English and French on Channel 1 and 2, respectively. We would, like, we would like also to thank the interpreter who volunteered to work for us on this special day. This ceremony is being live streamed around the world. We send our greetings to all our viewers and followers on Facebook Live. It is a pleasure and an honor for me to welcome you to the World Meteorological Day Ceremony. Every year, National Meteorological and Hydrological Services worldwide celebrate the coming into force of the convention that established the World Meteorological Organization on the 23rd of March, 1950. That's 68 years ago. This year's World Meteorological Day team is weather ready, climate smart. WMO has produced a series of short animation on heat waves, flood, storms, and drought to illustrate the theme. This will be aired for the first time during this celebration. Our guest speakers today, Ms. Jill Peters and Professor Peter Hopper, will share their insights on our theme, weather ready, climate smart. NASA Earth will host a Facebook Live session with, our, with WMO Secretary General Petri Talas and Adam Monzon will join us from Puerto Rico about the lesson learned from Hurricane Maria. We thank all our speakers for joining us. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I now call upon Professor Petri Talas, Secretary General of the World Meteorological Organization, to give us his introductory remarks. Professor Talas, please. Thank you, and uh, welcome also on my behalf to celebrate the World Meteorological Day with, uh, with, uh, with the presence of uh, WMO staff and, uh, and, and uh, high-level people from Geneva missions and uh, other UN agencies. And I would like to welcome especially Michael Muller, Muller who is uh, head of UN uh, in, in Geneva, so you are most welcome. And I'm very pleased that we are having high-level panel here today, and uh, I'm sure that you will enjoy the, the, the presentations. And uh, after this event, you are most welcome to join a party upstairs uh, where our excellent staff has been cooking best food uh, from all over the world. Uh, and um, since we are the highest authority on, on weather, climate and water, we have the authority to also tune the weather and uh, I hope that you are happy with, uh, with the weather outdoors. We try to get uh, five degrees warmer climate, but, uh, but, uh, but, uh, but uh, this sunshine was best that we were able to, able to achieve. And, and today we are going to talk about uh, important uh, issues uh, very much uh, related to uh, disasters and uh, climate change and, uh, and, and the theme of, uh, of, uh, of uh, World Med Day is always decided by our Executive Council, so it's the highest authorities who decide uh, what is the theme and, uh, and, uh, and despite of the nice weather today uh, we, we may talk about uh, something which is not so nice and, uh, and, and hopefully it will be impressive uh, for you. Could I get my slides up? Okay, next please. 
So, uh, uh, there's an event uh, every year in Davos, uh, World Economic Forum, and uh, they are every year making estimations uh, which are the most uh, like ri likely risks and what is the impact of uh, various risks on, on, the, on the world uh, economy. And uh, at least for last year and, and this year in World Economic Forum, they estimated that, uh, that issues that we are dealing with the WMO, they are highest on the agenda. So, you can see that extreme weather natural disasters, uh, failure of uh, climate adaptation and um, mitigation, water crisis and food crisis, uh, they were the uh, most likely uh, problems for global economy this year and, and they are also the ones with highest uh, impact. Uh, there's also a new thing uh, which is this uh, orange color up there which is uh, related to uh, nuclear uh, nuclear war and, and the risk has a little bit uh, been rising since uh, since last year. But but uh, but anyhow, I, I, I'm, I'm it's, it's it's interesting to see that uh, that uh, the issues that WMO is dealing with they are highest on the on the agenda here. Next, please. And um, if we look at the disasters, uh, we will get the presentation from Professor Hoppe. Later, he's telling what, what, what we have observed in amount of disasters during the recent uh, decades. But last year, we were breaking all-time records. Uh, the natural disaster losses were 330 billion US dollars, and, uh, and, and about two-thirds of that was related to the hurricane season in the Caribbean. And there were also people uh, killed in South Asia, especially in, in flooding, flooding events. And the most severe uh, and most expensive flooding uh, was taking place in, during the hurricane season. There's a, there's a com competing broadcasting going on. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Okay, but anyhow, the, the, the most expensive uh, natural disaster that we were facing was uh, related to Hurricane Harvey, which was uh, hitting, hitting Texas and especially city of uh, Houston. And, uh, and, and uh, one would expect to see such uh, flooding taking place in, in Houston every thousand years. So this, is, this was really a rare event, and uh, because of climate change, we have started seeing the frequency of, uh, of uh, certain events uh, becoming... Uh, becoming more so more often that we observe them more frequently, and it was not only the hurricane that was a problem, but it was mainly mainly the, the, the rainfall rainfall after the which was related to the to the hurricane, and and uh, the sea water in Caribbean was two degrees warmer than normally, which was giving more energy for the hurricanes, and uh, then we have also more humidity in the lower atmosphere, which is which was also boosting the flooding, flooding problem that was faced, uh, faced there. This is the global temperature record for, uh, uh, me measured by, estimated by a Japanese, uh, European, two European and two North American organizations and the story is, uh, is the same from all of those and you can see that uh, the warming clearly continues and uh, last year 2017 uh, was, the, was the warmest uh, non El Nino year. In 2016 especially, we got the boosting impact of uh, fairly strong El Nino. And, and we are now more than one degree above the long-term average. And if you look at the anomalies uh, globally, uh, one can see that the Arctic area is the area where we have seen largest uh, deviations last year. But in, in general, uh, over the continents, we, we can see positive numbers, and over the oceans, a little bit uh, smaller, smaller numbers. And, uh, and the Arctic uh, warming is, is one of the very interesting features. I will come back to that uh, fairly soon. And we are working now together with other UN agencies uh, by repo uh, prepare, pre preparing annual status of uh, climate and disasters uh, Report and, and this, is, this uh, slide is coming from IMF. Uh, they have estimated uh, what uh, the current the one degree warming, uh, what kind of e economic impact it has had. And the red colors indicate uh, one to two degree drop in GDP, and, and the green colors indicate uh, two to four degrees uh, 
increase in GDP. And you can see that the world is uh, quite uneven in in Southern Hemisphere and in Africa, Southern Asia. It's it's lots of uh, red color, and, uh, and 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 that's showing that we we already this one degree warming has had a negative impact on economies. At high northern latitudes, you can see the opposite, uh, but, uh, but that's not uh, compensating the losses in, in most parts of the world. Sea level rise, uh, we have been measuring it with the satellites since 93, and you can see that the sea level rise uh, continues, and, and so far we have seen about 26 centimeters uh, sea level rise since the late, uh, late 19th century. And which are the factors uh, behind sea level rise? In the upper panel, we have uh, what was the case in 93, 2004, and, uh, and, and the lower one, what was the case during the past uh, 10 years. And, and uh, the major factor uh, has been thermal expansion of the seawater. Second one is uh, glaciers. And actually, actually uh, the melting of Greenland is, is nowadays uh, number two. And, and there has been almost tripling of the of the, of the melting of the Greenland uh, glacier during the past uh, 10 years. So that's related to the Arctic, uh, overall Arctic warming. Arctic sea ice coverage uh, is uh, shrinking, and, and we, have seen, we have seen year-to-year -year variations, which are related to also weather events, but the overall trend is, uh, is, uh, is negative. This is uh, September Arctic sea ice uh, coverage. And even more dramatic change has been observed in the mass of uh, Arctic sea ice. We have melted 75% of the mass of uh, Arctic sea ice, and uh, so-called multi-year ice, uh, two, three, and four-year ice has practically disappeared, uh, as if we compare the case in 84 and 2016, which is the case, uh, case here. And, uh, and the changes in the uh, Arctic uh, snow and ice cover, they are having I impacts on the radiation uh, balance of the, of the planet, and they are having impacts on the, on the weather patterns, and uh, on the jet, st jet stream, and, and also the polar vortex, uh, which is observed in the, in the stratosphere. And, uh, and we say that what happens in the Arctic doesn't stay in the Arctic. Uh, this is coming from Las Vegas, where they, they're having <laughs> strange life. Uh, some Arctic people may also do it, but, uh, but, uh, but here is an example of, uh, of what happens when the Arctic uh, air masses are intruded to lower latitudes, and that was uh, taking place in North America uh, during the Christmas uh, break, and uh, more recently we have seen such things happening also, also here in Europe. So, so and, and also in this case, you can see that the uh, Arctic is fairly red, so we have seen unusually warm temperatures there and, uh, and, and unusually cold temperatures outside of the Arctic. I'm just coming from an Arctic uh, Council meeting uh, in, in Lapland, and, uh, and, and uh, we discussed also what's happening to the greenhouse gases uh, globally. And here we have two records, one from uh, Lapland and one from Mauna Loa, and you can see the same story here, that the increase of uh, carbon dioxide concentration continues, and the amplitude is, is, is larger in the Arctic, and that's related to the use of energy in, 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 in winter time of the year, and, uh, and its sink of uh, carbon to the forests in, in summer time of the, of the year. One of the uh, uh, things of, uh, matters of concern related to the Arctic is what's going to happen to the methane, which is stored in the Arctic uh, wetlands, and uh, this was also discussed uh, uh, last week in, 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 in the Arctic Council meeting. And it seems that we have, we have seen the same uh, growing methane trend in the Arctic, which, which is the global case, but, uh, but we haven't seen uh, a, a rapid uh, release of methane to the atmosphere, which is one of the matters of uh, concern uh, related to climate change. So it's not happening at least yet. And then a uh, picture which is showing what, what has happened uh, to carbon dioxide uh, in, in, in the long run. On, on the uh, uh, left-hand side of this picture, you can see the uh, carbon dioxide uh, concentration from 200 ppm to 2000 uh, ppm, and this 2000 is something like five times the current uh, concentration. And uh, 
and we have uh, data which is coming from indirect uh, estimates from uh, from uh, from biological sources, and, and then we have uh, ice core data for the past 800,000 uh, years, which is this black uh, black curve in the middle, and, uh, and and we have already exceeded 400 ppm of carbon dioxide, and, and that was that such concentrations we observed uh, three million years ago, and, and, and that time there was an estimation that the sea level was 10 to 30 meters higher than today, and uh, the temperature was about 2 to 4 degrees warmer than today. So already this 400 ppm level is, uh, is somewhat the critical level. And here we, 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 we can see what may happen to the temperature in the future, and if we, if we continue emitting and, and use all the fossil resources, we would reach uh, 2,000 ppm, and, and that would mean 8 degrees warmer planet, for which would uh, last for thousands of, uh, of years. And, and we are fairly soon to this 2 degree target, which is about uh, 500 uh, ppm of uh, carbon, carbon dioxide. And uh, one of the sinks of uh, carbon dioxide are the, are, are the oceans, and uh, we have uh, started seeing also changes in the chemical composition of the seawater, and, and the pH of uh, seawater is, is getting lower, and, uh, and, and this is uh, most effective at the high, high latitudes with colder uh, sea waters. So, and that may have, uh, in the long run, impacts on the ocean ecosystems. And perhaps one of the most uh, 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 challenging issues related to climate change is what's going to happen to the global uh, agriculture. Uh, and this is an estimation from uh, World Resources Institute uh, with uh, three degrees uh, warming, which is uh, close to this Paris uh, uh, agreement pledges. And, and, and these red colors indicate uh, uh, de decline of uh, crop yields, and, and uh, green colors indicate uh, positive numbers. And, and you can see that the, most of the uh, world is uh, red, which is uh, showing that we are, we are taking certain risks uh, how, how to feed the growing uh, world's population if we, if we face uh, three, three degrees uh, warming. And, and it's uh, only a few parts of the world where you can, you can see green color and, and they are not ready to, that's not going to compensate the, the potential losses in other parts of the world. And, and finally, uh, if we want to uh, mitigate the climate change, uh, this is our big, uh, big question, what to do with uh, with the energy system, and uh, at the moment we are producing about 85% of, of the energy is related to fossil energy, and, and only 15% is related to nuclear, hydro, or, or renewables, and, and uh, if we are serious with Paris uh, Agreement implementation, we should reverse this, uh, this picture. We should have 85% uh, produced by, uh, by nuclear, hydro, and, and renewables, and, uh, and only 15% uh, based on, on, on uh, fossil, fossil energy. So that's, that's a big question to mankind, and that's a big question to implementation, related to implementation of Paris Agreement. And finally, I would like to say a few words what's happening here at the WMO. Uh, our last Congress decided that we should carry out the constituent body reform uh, to, to modernize our working practices and, and also several of our the structures uh, here, and, and that's what we have started uh, doing as a secretariat together with our, our members. And at the moment we are running a structure where we have executive council which is having several bodies under it, and we have eight uh, technical commissions, and, uh, and then we have regional associations which are having their own, own uh, speci specialist uh, bodies. We are, running, uh, we are running three parallel universities. And, uh, and uh, our executive council has already decided that we will not touch our regional association structure, but we are placing some of our regional activities to regions. Uh, we are soon going to open our office in Singapore and hopefully later this year also our office in Addis Abeba to serve uh, the interests of uh, Pacific, uh, Asia and Africa. At the moment, we have uh, too many WMO programs. We have been always adding new programs uh, to the structure, and uh, there will be a proposal to simplify this uh, program structure, which our Executive Council is uh, supposed to endorse in June, and, and our Congress next year is supposed to decide it. 
And, uh, and what, what we are seeking for is that we would have uh, better management uh, responsibilities and our executive council would have a stronger role in guiding the work of, uh, of, 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 of WMO. And we are also eager to uh, engage our key partners to our work and, and we, we, have, we would like to favor a holistic earth system approach, uh, meteorology, hydrology, climatology, oceanography under the same umbrella and also multi-hazard uh, approach in our our work and, and the same same for for climate activities to have one umbrella for all climate uh, related activities and and then we would like to play more important role in in field of uh, hydrology and uh, and also there's a need to engage private sector actors in our our work and finally uh, the, the idea is to use the resources uh, in secretariat and, and the member resources more wisely perhaps i don't go to the details here, uh, but uh, just to uh, conclude that we also aim at, uh, at uh, having new activities carried out by WMO and, and this private sector engagement in our work, that's one of the new uh, activities for us. And then urban uh, services, that's one of the new areas where we want to be active, air quality, disasters and climate adaptation, they are they are hitting the urban areas in a very different way than, than the rural areas and uh, better engagement of hydrological and scientific communities in our work. That's one of our challenges. And then the European countries have built a, a global uh, warning system called the Meteo Alarm and we are just in the process to build a global Meteo Alarm and, uh, so that every country would have access to that kind of information and, and also the various stakeholders in the countries could see what kind of warnings there are out. And also in the UN system there's a need for early warning services related to disasters, uh, uh, seasonal predictions and uh, El Niño, La Niña variability and, and we have already had a trial in New York for, for that and we want to continue that kind of uh, activity. Then there's a need to enhance greenhouse gas monitoring globally and, and finally we want to trace the status of our, our members in a better fashion. And finally I would like to wish you uh, uh, most happy World Meteorological Day and uh, our ancestors uh, who were meeting, having a meeting in Vienna some years ago. Uh, I think that they are joining, joining our, our party also spiritually and, um, and, uh, and I'm happy to see that the gender balance here is a little bit better than in that meeting in 1873 when there was not a single woman present. So, so the world has uh, changed uh, not only in climate-wise but also gender-wise. Gender so thanks for coming and uh, I would like to wish you all an uh, enjoyable World Med Day. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Talas. Excellencies, Ladies and gentlemen, our first guest speaker is Ms. Jill Peters, founder of Climate Without Border, a global community of weather presenters who promote climate communication. Ms. Peters is mother of three teenage girls and passionate about the weather and its impact on people. She has 18 years experience in media meteorology and 12 years in climate communication. Jill Peters has won the European Meteorological Society's TV Weather Forecast Award, the European Climate Change Communication Award, and the Press Prize on Sustainable Development. In 2017, she was invited by UN Climate Change to become a member of the High Climate Action Leadership Network. She played an instrumental role in the acclaimed WMO video series of weather forecasts for the future. A familiar face to Belgian TV viewers, Jill Peters is determined to make Climate Without Border a global success. Ms. Peters, the floor is yours. Okay. Bonjour à tous et à toutes.
Je suis flamande, alors je vais continuer en anglais. <rire> euh, mais quand même, je suis aussi belge et je sais quand même débrouiller en français, mais je vais continuer en anglais. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation of being here. In fact, um, it was a childhood dream that came true when I started presenting the weather. I'm quickly going to turn my computer because I don't see my own slides. That will help. No? Okay, there it is. I hope that noise doesn't come from my computer. We'll see. So, um, I'm pretty fortunate to have had the opportunity to go and study geography, and I also had a master in uh, meteorology. Um, it was my childhood dream to present the weather. It was very cool to start presenting the weather at VTM, which is the largest commercial TV channel uh, in my country. And through the years, I wrote books on weather, on climate. I created a child program. I danced for the climate. I sang for the climate. I gave interviews. I kind of did everything for the climate. Uh, last year, I had the opportunity to talk about my passion to our Royal Highness, uh, the King Prince, uh, King Philip. Um, last year was a great opportunity to also connect with that kind of people. And I was pretty honored to um, uh, be one of the founding members of the Climate Action Leadership ne Network, which started last year in, at the General Assembly uh, in New York. I assume you all have something with the weather. If not, you wouldn't have been here. But I'm kind of convinced that I have the coolest job there is in the world. I can cheer up a day, a rainy day. I can bring laughter in each and every room in the world just by telling stories about the weather. Uh, for example, today I saw a lot of smiling faces outside because the sun was shining. So when we talk, weather presenters, um, people listen and people love us for that. So I do think it's the coolest job in the world. Not always literally, as you can see here. Oh, I don't have sound with my video. Trust me, at the beach, we're not having any kind of um, <laughs> uh, sun come down to earth or anything like that. How did that happen? Continue with the dry spell and get the real heat. Whoa. Sometimes there are some things happening, but. <laughs> We try to use all elements of nature um, and we also try to um, use everything there is to explain and inform people. In Thailand, Sunida and Suhacha, it's the weather twin. They started uh, pre presenting the weather together because they wanted more people to watch the weather. So in Thailand, you get two for the price of one. Um, we really use everything to explain, for example, what 10, meter, uh, twen, 10 liters uh, uh, of rain is in a square meter. And as you can see, we like talking. We make a lot of noise, but we still continue because we like talking about the weather. Over the next few days, we're also We have some pretty serious And we all have one thing in common. We love the weather. And our weather is the best weather there is. And we don't want this weather to change. And we have an enormous reach. Here you, for example, can see some tweets and Instagram posts and Facebook posts of yesterday and today about the World Meteorological Day. You see Felicity from Ghana, you see Morocco, Greece, uh, Kenya, Uganda, Taiwan, uh, Qatar, uh, that's Al Jazeera, Everton from Al Jazeera. We've got Australia, um, Miami, USA, Argentina, India, Italy, uh, Nigeria, Germany, Ireland, uh, Brazil, Czech Republic, Holland, um, Ada, she will be later up today too. Um, and then I think, I don't see it from here, sorry, I think it's Italy too. And this uh, morning we had this picture on the television in Malawi. Weather ready, climate smart. 
thanks to all my colleagues of supporting us uh, with this action because we all love our weather and we don't want the weather to change. That's the thing we do have in common. But the weather has changed. We just saw um, the state of the climate of um, Secretary General. Um, the weather has changed and as you all know, maybe better than I know, uh, the weather will get worse. The impact is enormous. Um, people will fly, uh, flee away because of the extreme weather. People will die because of the weather. Um, and it's time to act now. And weather presenters are at the barricades of the changing weather. Our warnings do save lives. We need the warnings made up, for example, by WMO and other organizations. We need those warnings, but we weather presenters can bring these warnings to the public. And our warnings if you're listening to me on a Florida Key, if you're sitting on a Florida Key right now, what the heck are you doing? Get out now. In the Florida Keys, you are about to witness one of the worst hurricanes in the history of this country. And it, this thing is fixing to, as I used to say when I worked in Lake Charles, Louisiana, this thing is fixing to be a Category 5 hurricane pretty soon. Uh, it's down to, as you know, 155 miles an hour, but it's going to ramp up again. I'm confident, if not tonight, uh, tomorrow, we're going to have another Cat 5 again, and it's going to be on final approach to the Florida Keys. And for the Florida Keys, that means you'll have a 7 to 10 foot storm surge. You'll have flattening winds wiping everything out, plus the risk of tornadoes, plus, of course, uh, just uh, widespread rains. The overseas highway will be uh, inundated, uh, again, 10 feet above ground now, 10 feet above ground in some locations. That's the potential for the storm surge. Nobody can survive a storm surge that deep. There's John Morales. I think he was pretty clear. And it helped because people started to evacuate. I'm going to give you a small other example, a more personal uh, example. I don't know whether you know uh, the lady in blue. It's Elizabeth Holland. She's a climate scientist. I met her uh, during the COP21 in Paris, and we've been talking a lot about the 1.5 and the 2 degrees. Just after the signment of uh, the Paris Agreement, um, there was Hurricane Winston developing on the ocean and I remember me mailing to her like saying okay Elizabeth what are precautions you're taking because that's interesting information for my weather report in my country and one of the questions I asked her is okay I can see you will get a lot of rain a lot of wind but what about the storm surge she never responded I saw her at a cup in Fiji last year I, I mean the cup in Bonn but it was a cup Fiji um, and she came to me and she said, Jill, you really saved some people's lives. I was like, okay, how did I do that? Well, just by asking her, what will the storm surge be? Because in Fiji, they were communicating about the wind and the rain, but not about the waves. And she put it, uh, a warning on her Facebook uh, stating that there might come some waves of at least 10 meters. As you probably all know, all know um, Cyclone Winston is still uh, the most intense cyclone in the Southern uh, Hemisphere on record, and waves were up to 12 meters. But because of putting this warning on her Facebook, some villages and some schools started to ev evacuate, especially the schools near the shoreline, uh, near the coastline. And she said, if it wasn't for that only question on the storm surge, we wouldn't have been evacuating uh, those schools. So our warnings can save lives. But warnings are not enough. That's where Climate Without Borders comes in. We want to take actions, but we also want to promote actions, actions that can help us prevent um, more extreme weather to occur. This picture is taken last year uh, in Brussels um, when Climate Without Borders was formally founded. On this picture in the middle you see Christiana Figueres and Patricia Espinosa, but also the Vice President, President of the European Commission, also one of the board members of the Global Covenant of Mayors, and um, you 
you might see there on the top Michael Williams and um, John Hay from UNFCCC and WMO. Um, we are very fortunate to have this group together and they are pretty proud to be the founding members now of Climate Without Borders. One of them is also Adam Monzon from uh, Puerto Rico, who's on a bit later um, in this session. What we will do is educate, motivate, and activate people. It's very simple, but it's crucial. And we are very lucky to have the momentum at our side. You all read the Paris Agreement, I assume. Well, there's Article 12 which states that all parties shall cooperate, cooperate on um, taking actions towards climate education, climate awareness, and especially in these times of fake news and alternative effects, it's a good thing to focus on education uh, for each and everyone. Our dream is to become the preferential partner for this article, Article 12 of the Paris Agreement. Um, with the SDGs, you all feel probably connected to the lower part of this SDGs uh, concerning the biosphere, um, the SDGs 13, 14, 15. Um, but our main focus will probably be um, 17 because we are seeking partnerships with Climate Without Borders because we need a lot of information to educate. We're going to educate weather presenters, but weather presenters um, will use that knowledge to create a reach towards, towards their uh, viewers, towards their followers on media. But we cannot do this alone. We need more help. Um, we were only founded last year. Um, I want to become recognized by the UN, but therefore I have to exist two years. So I'm not there yet, <laughs> but I probably will be uh, next year. Um, this is the business plan of the organization. <laughs> we need a lot of information, climate information, weather information. Uh, we need information from companies who are working on sustainability. We need a lot of, of input. And all the, of that input goes through the weather presenter. And the output is good information and education towards the whole humanity in need. <laughs> Um, how are we going to do this? Uh, we want to organize, for example, boot camps, maybe at the next COPs. Um, we'd love to do that. We are creating a weather box. I will tell you a bit more about the weather box after this. And first of all, we need to strengthen and build our community. And we also need your information and your actions because we, weather presenters, want to give leverage to all of these uh, valuable actions. It's very important to build a community. At this moment we are 25 founding members, you see the picture on the left, but there is more. I'm holding here my mobile phone and this mobile phone has the app WhatsApp and in this group of WhatsApp um, that I created just after the Paris Agreement um, are only weather presenters and Claire from the WMO. <laughs> and we are exchanging on a daily basis information on weather, extreme weather, um, climate, new studies, questions, whatever. We have 140 weather presenters of 110 countries right now. We exchange this information, we use it on all kinds of platforms, and um, our dream is now to have the ability to uh, create rules of engagement for all of the members so that we can become a stronger community. Right now, we're formally the 25 founding members, but there's more potential in it. We can cover um, kind of all of the world. Right now, you see the green countries there on the map, which represent a part of the members and in the WhatsApp group, because I just added Australia, Croatia, and Oman. Uh, but there are still some gaps, so if you go home and if, if, if you travel around the world and you see one or other weather report and a weather presentator and you think like, oh, they don't have Peru yet, just mail me the name and the contact and, and uh, Curaçao and, and chat, welcome, we don't have uh, them yet, so if you know a weather presenter of your country who's not in the network yet, just 
hand me over the contact details and we'll um, put them in the network and hopefully one day we, we become a strong community that will exchange more uh, information. It's very inspiring to be in this uh, vibrant group. Um, we exchange a lot of um, best practices. Um, most of us started to know each other during the Forum International de la Meteorologie, which is an event that takes place once a year. It's a great event. Um, um, but Climate Without Borders want to become kind of a link which between um, uh, a linkage between all of uh, the weather and climate events. So a sustainable educational platform. Right now, the founding members have a reach of 375 million viewers a day. That's the reach of the 25 founding members. But in this WhatsApp group, we have the potential to reach a billion viewers a day. So I think it's not even that difficult <laughs> for us to, to uh, have that reach. Um, I had the opportunity to organize some workshops together with WMO. Um, Bernadette uh, from Climate Central uh, did the first workshop with WMO in Hanoi. It was a workshop with weather presenters. It was not so long before um, the Paris Agreement came into force. Then we had a workshop in Tokyo. Uh, we were there at COP21 and with uh, Monsieur Giraud was there too. And COP22 in Marrakesh um, was the next um, workshop uh, WMO organized. And I continued this work at uh, the COP in Bonn. It was a very small group because I was running out of funding. But uh, nevertheless, we had the opportunity to speak to talk to experts to, um, about impacts. For example, at the bottom um, left, you see Martin van Alst. It's his back, but <laughs> Martin van Alst from uh, the Red Cross Red Crescent. It was about resilience, about impact. Um, we had a lot of input from, from experts and scientists. And we were very honored to have the Secretary General uh, with us, too, of WMO, of course. And we really enjoyed the talk we had. And one of the effects that had, Mr. Talas, you probably don't know that yet, but um, at the right uh, side, at the bottom, you see um, Tamas. Tamas, he is the weather presenter from Hungary. He had never been out of his office, of his weather room, never been to any conference, and then he came to the workshop of Climate Without Borders. And then he met the Secretary General, and he was so impressed by this that he, um, he really felt honored, and he called his uh, TV channel. He said, look, I have this big opportunity. I meet a lot of impressive, interesting people here, and we never do anything about extreme weather at our TV channel, not about the Paris Agreement, not about the urgency that the, the challenge is. So um, his producer invited him, as soon as he came back to, to his country, invited him to um, create a TV, um, um, not a program, but a discussion on this. And he had seven minutes of prime time on the national television in Hungary. That was just the effect of a very small workshop. So um, it's very important to um, support the weather presenters, to inspire the weather presenters, and to educate them, because their reach is enormous. And um, even now, he's still thinking on how he can continue talking about extreme weather and climate. So hopefully, one day, we can become the preferential partner uh, of the UNFCCC and of all parties on Article 12. Um, one practic practical way to do this is that uh, the parties take their weather men or weather women in their delegation to the COP, and then Climate Without Borders can take care of those people and tune them over into becoming um, good communicators on um, the changing weather. Another project we're working on is a weather box. Next Monday, I will be sitting together uh, with some people of the KMI. It's the, our national Met Office, but also with um, um, yeah some other people, and we're working on a weather box. I cannot 
tell you too much officially about this and because it's this is real life on Facebook Live, I cannot give you too much details, but if you want to know more about it, you come and talk to me after this session. But in short, it's a citizen science e-learning platform we're building. Um, it will give us an answer on a very important scientific question, but it will also, um, um, yeah, bring the climate challenge to um, the heart of the people, because we will scale it down to extreme weather. And you probably recognize this map, it's the map with all the climates, and um, one of my daughters had to study this a few months ago, and she's she, daughter of a weather presenter. She said, Mama, why do I have to know this, and how can I put this knowledge in my head, I don't see it, I don't get it, and well, we will, with the weather box, we will have a new way of um, understanding the differences in climate, and as you all know, climate right now is without borders, climate is crossing borders, um, there are new kinds of weather in, um, in new countries where that kind of weather has never been that extreme, and so on, so the weather box will become um, a real-time live uh, online um, platform to exchange data uh, among uh, schools and governments. And hopefully we'll have some support of WMO for that too. Climate Without Borders doesn't want anyone to die anymore because of the changing weather. There's so much information available, we put so much information online, but we must build on getting that information to the citizens. And we can invest a lot in the message, and the message is clear, but nobody ever really thought about the messenger. And that's what we want to work at with Climate Without Borders. I'm a very proud founder. I work day and night on this. And uh, I really hope that this will succeed. Um, this will become a success, I mean. And to end, I leave the word to someone else. I ain't gonna do that, you know I, what I'm saying? I was just gonna say, I think I just lost my me? job. You ain't lose your job, yeah. you know why? why? Because, eh, cause, because your job matters. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> and we're gonna leave it at that. Merci beaucoup, Ms. Peter, pour cette présentation. We now cross the Atlantic for a Facebook live chat hosted by NASA Earth. WMO Education and Training Division works closely with NASA GLOBE program. The GLOBE Observer encourages the citizen, uh, citizen science and observation of weather and clouds. Professor Talas will explore with NASA Group how to be weather ready and climate smart. So hello everybody. Hello, we are also alive in Geneva. Wonderful. Hello, I'm Jessica Taylor and I'm a physical scientist here at NASA Langley. And my name is Marile Colon Roman. I am the Globe Club lead, also a scientist. Um, we're so excited to be able to do this collaboration today with the World Meteorological Organization. Um, and I was a Globe student. Um, I did globe observations while I studied meteorology, and I'm excited. I feel like it's my opportunity to share the program that I grew up with um, with all of you. Mm -hmm. It's quite an honor to share our passion for science, and particularly clouds in our atmosphere today. Uh, so when we have everything in place in uh, Switzerland, let us know, and we'll be able to go live on Facebook. So we are ready also in Switzerland, and um, since we are a very advanced organization, we are already, already five minutes ahead of schedule, so um, <laughs> please continue from, from NASA.
So can you hear us? We can hear you, but we cannot see you. We've seen a podium. <laughs> Thank you. That's that, that's important. Yeah, and if we can um, do that zoomed in shot there for um, Dr. Talis, that would be wonderful. Okay, so 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 we are here about uh, 200 people in Geneva, and we are celebrating the World Bed uh, Day with, uh, with with you, and uh, we are very pleased with the contribution of NASA to to both observing uh, uh, of, 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 of 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 weather. So. The most important reason behind uh, improved weather forecasts during the re recent uh, 10 years has been the inclusion of uh, satellite data and especially the polar orbiting data. And, um, and, and, and you have also uh, done a great job in enhancing uh, the scientific knowledge of, uh, of various components of the Earth, uh, Earth, Earth system. And, uh, and, and we are very grateful for you for, you for, for that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we're going to be ready to go live in just a moment. Um, if the camera in um, Switzerland, if you guys could zoom right on in on Pateri, that would be great. It'll just make it easier because when most people watch on Facebook Live, they're watching on a really small screen. So if we could zoom in. <clears throat> if you can go any further, that would be great. <laughs> One big. <laughs> I'm fairly big, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and and my, my my ego is even bigger. Yeah. <laughs> if you say so. And when we go live, we're going to wind up. Um, you will probably hear us, but we're going to mute the audio just right away um, to connect with Facebook, and then we'll, we'll be able to hear you again. Good. Thanks for the invitation, and uh, and we are about 200 people here in Geneva, and uh, and WMO has organized very beautiful sunshine for this event. I don't know how how successful you have been in organizing nice weather for at, at NASA side. Wonderful. Well, we're very happy to be joining you. And go ahead, why don't you tell 
us and all of our Facebook audience um, what is the World Meteorological Organization and what's so exciting about this today, World Met Day as we call it. So World Meteorological Organization is the UN specialized agency on, on weather, climate and water. So we are very much dealing with the global observing systems uh, from ground-based observations, balloon-borne observations, uh, satellite observations, which is very much the hardcore of, uh, of, of, of NASA. And uh, then we are very much dealing with the National Meteorological and Hydrological services which are uh, the safety authorities in their country and uh, providing uh, a wide range of uh, services for various uh, customers and, and also for the for the general public and then we are also dealing with uh, climate and, uh, and 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 also climate uh, research and, uh, and and climate uh, services and and then our third uh, component is related to uh, water and and uh, and the management of uh, global water resources and, and, and related services, uh, that's also one of our, our duties. And we have 191 members and uh, almost all of the United Nations members, they are our, our members and a large part of our work is done by our member countries. We have about 200,000. It's a huge organization and its ability to um, provide such valuable information to society. Um, I understand that this year's theme for World Meteorological Day is Weather Ready and Climate Smart. Um, can you tell us a little more about that? Yeah, so, so this Weather Ready means that, uh, that we have uh, uh, started seeing growing amount of disasters and, uh, and, and also the economic losses to, related to disasters. They have uh, almost tripled since, uh, since, the, since the 80s and, um, and, and, and we have to mm -hmm. provide uh, better early warning services for general public and, and various uh, users of uh, such uh, in information to be able to, to mitigate the risks and, uh, and, and also to save, uh, save lives. And, yeah. uh, and, and climate uh, is, is uh, we have seen climate change and, uh, and because of that uh, we, we, have, we have started seeing growing amount of uh, disasters and, uh, and, 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 and one have, has to adapt also to to the change climate and for example the changes in the Arctic uh, they have had impacts on, on, on low latitudes and uh, some of the yes, un unusually cold weather patterns that you have faced also in, in the USA they have been related to changes yes, in the Arctic, or, 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 Arctic climate <laughs> and, and recently yeah. we, have, we have faced that also in European countries. Well that's really interesting to hear um, you know the connection between the WMO and engaging these services across all of the countries and being able to better prepare everyone um, for weather and also for climate. If you're just joining us, we are here at NASA Langley Research Center. We're here in the studio here in Hampton, Virginia, and we are also connecting live with the World Meteorological Organization in Geneva, Switzerland. And we're just getting ready to talk a little more with Marie um, So I understand you're the lead for Global Clouds. And we talked a little bit about how um, maybe our audience can practice meteorological observations by making observations through Globe Observer. Tell mm -hmm. us about that. Yeah, so it's really exciting. So Globe Observer is an app that's free and available for everybody. You can use an Android device or an Apple device. Um, the uh, Globe Observer app is part of the Globe program, the yeah. Globe program. GLOBE stands for Global Learning and Observations to Benefit the Environment. It's a program, international program, been around for 20 years. Inviting people, students, teachers, everybody around the world to make their observations about the environment. Mm -hmm. Now, with the Global Surround, you can download it for free, and it, step, and it steps you, little by little, on how to make your observations. Practice makes perfect, yes. but it only really guides you, the app guides you on how to make those cloud observations. Here, the team at NASA Langley, we receive those information and then we match your observations with satellite data that was right overhead at more or less the same time. So a user of the app is making a cloud observation and then if they were taking it at the same time as a satellite has overhead, they get information about that? Yeah. Yeah. So we send you uh, an email just for you with your observations compared to all the different satellites that saw the clouds that were right overhead 
um, where you were at. You can match from one to maybe even up to four satellites. And this is really important for us and researchers around the world because not everything that's white is a cloud, right, from the perspective of the satellite. Oh, from, from space. From space, yeah. So for you, it's really easy to see these thin clouds, particularly when there's snow on the ground. For satellites, that's something tricky sometimes. So that's just one of the benefits of having you make your observations and send them to them. So I've seen a little bit um, online and in different news sites about this Globe Cloud Challenge. It's getting a lot of press. Tell us about that. Yeah, so um, Globe Cloud has released the Spring Cloud Observation Data Challenge. It just started. It's not too late. It's starting March 15th, and it'll run until April 15th. Um, when we're asked anyone from around the world, download the Globe Observer app. You can go to uh, observer.globe.gov uh, mm -hmm. um, and download the app and make your observations. Make 10 observations per day, and then the top observer will get a congratulatory video from a NASA scientist, and it'll be posted on the Globe site. That's pretty amazing. So anyone who is probably a Globe country mm -hmm. um, can download this app, and we have it up on the screen, observer.globe.gov. Is a website that you can go to to learn how to download the app, as well as learn a little bit more about what my today was talking about this Globe Cloud Challenge. Now, again, if you're just joining us, uh, we are live here at NASA Langley Research Center in Hampton, Virginia, um, and we are also connected with Switzerland because we are celebrating World Meteorological Day with the World Meteorological Organization. So let's go back to Switzerland. And um, so Terry, you know, my today was talking to us about this idea of engaging um, citizen scientists in making these observations. Can you tell us a little more about um, why it's important to engage communities and have community involvement in relation to meteorology? So, so we have classically had uh, the stations where we make uh, observations, but uh, nowadays it's uh, it's it's uh, it, there's a great opportunity to get some complementary data from uh, from in individual human beings and uh, and the cloud observations uh, they are, they have always been a challenge. From satellites, you can see 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 the things from uh, from from the space and. Uh, and, and, and you can get uh, some uh, some information uh, at various uh, wavelengths, and and, uh, and 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 you can, for example, see what is the water content of the of the clouds. Okay. But if you want to know more about clouds, uh, it's, better, it's it's good to get some complementary data from uh, from uh, from the Earth, and uh, and 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 we have a network of uh, weather stations where those observations are made. But uh, but uh, the network is in most countries fairly sparse, and uh, and, uh, and and this complementary data from uh, by individual ob observers and human beings that's uh, that's yeah, highly so they can highly fill useful. In those gaps, right? So that's that, that's very good, and, uh, and 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 nowadays we are talking about big data, and 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 again, uh -huh. and the backbone is uh, are these uh, high quality stations run by the national med services, but. Uh, but besides that, uh, uh, the complementary data from uh, uh, done by uh, carried out by uh, by individual stations and, and, and human beings and o organizations that's uh, that's highly useful. And, and we have been able to show that uh, once you add uh, this complementary data, you can you, can, you also can improve the quality of the of the forecasts. Ah, yeah, and you know humans have been making observations of clouds forever, right? And making observations of the sky. Well, I want to go to um, some questions from our audience members. Um, again, if you're just joining us, we are celebrating World Meteorological Day with the World Meteorological Organization. Um, and they're joining us live from Geneva, Switzerland. Um, and of course, we're celebrating here at NASA. And we are at the studio at NASA Langley Research Center in Hampton, Virginia. So um, one of the questions we were talking about the theme of um, being weather ready and climate smart. So Marile, um, we have a lot of questions about what's the difference between weather and climate. Mm -hmm. And that's a really good question because the main difference is time. It's this very mm -hmm. long time. When you look at what's happening on a for a day or a few days, that's what we call weather. But once you start looking uh, for a month, different months, a year, multiple years, 
Now you're starting to see a pattern, and that's what we call climate. And this is where the saying is that climate is what you expect, whether it's what you get. I've used that before. <laughs> So um, what to expect right now is springtime here in the Northern Hemisphere. So we are expecting temperatures to be a little bit warmer. Yes. That, not yet super warm, right? Maybe some shower here and there, right, for our May flowers to start growing. And what did we get today? We got a beautiful, sun, sunny day. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, I imagine all these countries have these little sayings, right, about um, uh, April showers, spring May flowers, those sorts of things, and that's more about the climate and then whether it's those day-to-day -day variations. Um, another question, um, let's go back to Switzerland. Um, Pateri, one of the questions, you know, we're celebrating World Meteorological Day. So the question here is, why did you become a meteorologist? Why did you join this field of meteorology in general? <laughs> That's a good question. In, in, in my family, we have lots of uh, me medical doctors, and, uh, and, and it, was, it was good to do something else than the, than the other family. And, uh, and, and, and actually, when I started my meteorology studied, uh, studies, I realized that this is, this is a highly fascinating topic. Uh, it's lots of new science uh, advances in, in science and, and, and also the, uh, the, the international nature of this uh, science, that's, that, that's fascinating. And it has yeah. also this uh, socioeconomic uh, connections. So, so uh, I have been dealing with... Yes, uh, benefiting, right? Benefiting and, society. And I have been, uh, as a scientist, I have been dealing with acidification, ocean depletion, and, 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 and more recently uh, climate change, and, 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 and they all have... Uh, the socioeconomic uh, connections, and that makes it uh, even more interesting than just uh, just science, uh, which doesn't have these kind of uh, these kind of yeah, connections. Um, so I am also a meteorologist, and I have to give a shout out to Florida State University, where I got my degree, and um, congratulating the men's basketball team with the win late last night. Um, so congratulations, Florida State. <laughs> where did you go to school? I went to the Yeah, so you have been uh, building uh, satellite programs that are most uh, important uh, both for, 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 for the weather forecast uh, business and, and, and also for the, for the atmospheric and climate uh, science. And, uh, and, um, and, and there have been quite nice improvement of the weather forecast uh, skills during the past uh, 20 years. And, and there are three factors behind that. One is that we have... Uh, because supercomputers nowadays, uh, the second one is that we, there have been advances in scientific uh, skills, and, and the third one is that we, we have got ex access to uh, modern satellite uh, information that, uh, for example, NASA and NOAA from, from USA are, are, are providing. So satellite uh, measurements have highly contributed to the accuracy of forecasts, and, and, uh, and nowadays we can forecast uh, uh, things that we were able to forecast for two days in the in, in, in 20 years ago. Now we can have the same accuracy for for, for, for forecast uh, for, for for one week. And the second uh, issue is related to, to science. And and for example, when we are monitoring the sea level rise or or changes in the Arctic uh, snow and ice cover or, or what's happening to the glaciers, uh, satellites are most uh, most important uh, tools for that, and, and NASA is fam famous also for 
for the ozone, o ozone research uh, with NASA instruments, yeah. we, were, we were able to monitor what's happening to the ozone depletion at the high latitudes, and, and, and luckily now we can see the recovery of the ozone layer thanks to, 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 thanks to Montreal Protocol. So you have also contributed uh, to this kind of success story. Well, it makes us here at NASA happy to hear about um, the benefits, you know, of, of all of the data that NASA produces and distributes really around the world. Again, if you're just joining us, we are celebrating World Meteorological Day at NASA and at the World Meteorological Organization. And we see a few comments in the, um, the box about those of you who already have the Globe Observer app, that's awesome. If you are interested in getting the Globe Observer app, you can search for it in your app store. It's free for Android and Apple devices. Um, it's called Globe Observer, or you can go to observer.globe.gov and learn a little more about the app, um, and also about its connections with this larger Globe program. So there's a few connections here, you know, talking with WMO, um, a, a, a world organization, right? All of these communities, and the Globe program is that as well, right? All a bunch of communities around the world. Yes, that's right. It's an international community where people have gathered from different countries and said, um, we want to get the community involved to go outside and make different measurements, environmental measurements. So they do cloud observations, but not just that. They also do soils, they do plants, they do rivers, they monitor birds. It's a um, barrage of data that people are collecting day by day, and students and teachers particularly. Yeah. So this idea for systems, um, Terry was talking about You know, one of the major advances now is being able to understand because of satellites how um, you know what happened in the Arctic has an impact around the world. And so for students to be able to study soils and how is that related to precipitation is pretty awesome. Um, we do have another question I'm going to give to you, Marile, which is um, what can some clouds tell us about the weather? Are there particular clouds that someone might look out by and say, oh, okay, that's going to, something's going to happen. <laughs> yeah. Um, there is a complete correlation between the weather and the effects that you see. Um, because of the storms, I like to say that cirrus clouds, they're, they're made by storm clouds or cumulonimbus clouds. They hit the troposphere and then they spread apart, or they hit the tropopause and then they spread, and that's how they form. So if you are in the mid latitudes and you start seeing some cirrus clouds, there might be some weather on its way, maybe 24 to 48 hours. Now, if you see some uh, alpha cumulus, these then look puffy. Some people call it like um, sheep. They look like sheep all around. Yeah. <laughs> um, it, it says that you're going to have a great day. Ah, the weather uh -huh. has just passed, so uh, you're going to have a great day right there. Um, and uh, Patricia, let's go to you for one of these questions too. Um, one of the questions here is, uh, how do clouds impact temperature? So, so we have uh, various types of clouds, and, and uh, you just mentioned the cirrus clouds. Uh, they are not having very big impact on on, on, on temperature, uh, but then once we have uh, fairly thick clouds like uh, cumulonimbus clouds, uh, they are really really having a big impact on the on the radiation that uh, reaches the Earth's surface, and, and usually you have uh, much uh, cooler cooler weather because of uh, of that. It, it depends on the on the thickness of the of the clouds, uh, and uh, and uh, and and then we have also specific uh, clouds related to hurricanes or typhoons, uh, and, and and they are one of the more dramatic ones and. Uh, uh, we talked about uh, ozone depletion as well. There are so-called polar, polar stratospheric clouds, uh, which are very beautiful, but uh, they are the ones on, on which surfaces uh, we can see the ozone, ozone depletion taking, taking place. So there are various uh, types of uh, those. And in, in summertime at the high latitudes, you can see also so-called noctilucent uh, clouds, which are about at uh, 70 kilometers altitude, and uh, and they have uh, they have uh, some iron uh, compounds embedded in in them. So they are so, so they are, they are also very beautiful if you have a chance to see them uh, at the high latitude yeah, uh, summer, well, uh, summer nights. Yeah, we've seen some uh, cloud art come in. Um, one of the things that uh, I think you were saying you were 
lone clouds observer enjoy doing is making the photos, right? Because clouds themselves are beautiful, not only the scientific value, but they're really beautiful. Can you tell us a little about the, the pictures that are taken at the globe observer? Yes, so the globe observer app makes uh, sense to you how to make the cloud observation, but then at the end, and using the options to submit your own cloud observation. And we highly encourage you to make those uh, pictures, to submit those pictures, um, because it gives us, the researchers, an idea of what's happening, what happened in that scene. Mm -hmm. Especially if we see a discrepancy between your observations and the satellite data. It might not just be you. It could be that the satellite had some problem detecting the cloud observations. So your observations and your pictures yeah. that you submitted, um, the researchers can go through and really see what's happening. Uh, particularly, researchers love pictures near the poles. Um, right now there's some Arctic and Antarctic cruises going on, and we love to see those pictures because satellites detect like if there were a fog right on the ground. So then your pictures will tell us there is a fog or um, it's, it's something that's happening with the uh, instruments on board the satellite. Yeah, so not only is it beautiful to observe the clouds, but scientific value there. I think many of us have been outside a really hot sunny day. We did have that big huge clouds that Terry was talking about roll overhead and immediately shade us. Um, now, tell us, is this data, who is this data then made available to? When someone makes an observation, who can access the data? Can the WMO access it? Who, who does that? Anybody around the world can access the data. If you go to the website of serverintheglobe.gov, you'll see data, a task called data, and it'll take you to a visualization um, portion on the globe site and you can see all the data collected for today. Mm -hmm. And then you can look at different days, you can look at different observations. We were talking about how you can look at clouds, but you can look at soil, you can look at rain, different days. So um, again, we're talking about the Globe Observer app at observer.globe.gov. I can't think of a better way to celebrate World Meteorological Day than um, talking about how you practice meteorology observations by making pictures and observing clouds and making that data available to everyone, including the World Meteorological Organization. And we have to say thank you very much um, to the World Meteorological Organization, Dr. Pateri Palace, thank you for joining us today. It was a great... Oh, go ahead. So it was a great pleasure to, to, to talk to you and, uh, and especially the years of this uh, program and, uh, and I hope that you will all celebrate uh, this uh, very important day to get together with us. So it was a pleasure to spend uh, the past 25 minutes with you. Thank you so much. Um, this is a, a true honor for us, uh, you know, being in atmospheric sciences to be able to celebrate this. So thank you, and again, um, the website to do uh, the get the app. <laughs> yeah, and um, we hope you consider downloading this free app and joining us in our love for meteorology and clouds by making these observations and being curious about the world around you. Thank you so much. Gracias. Thank you. Bye bye. Well, many thanks to our friends at NASA and to the viewers around the world. <laughs> now let's uh, watch a short video on animation on storm.
welcome, we welcome now our guest speaker, Professor Peter Hopper, who until his recent retirement was head of the GeoRisk Research Department and the Corporate Climate Center at Munichry. He will address what the insurance industry contributes to information on weather extremes and increased resilience. Professor Hopper is the chairman of the Munich Climate Insurance Initiative which he founded in 2005 and which won the UN Climate Change Momentum for Change Award at COP23 in Bonn last year. He is a member of many scientific societies and has been an advisor for the German government and UN organizations. Professor Hopper, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for your introduction and uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I will share some of uh, the information which is generated uh, by insurance companies because, uh, yeah, it works, uh, weather affects uh, the business model of uh, many insurers uh, because covering risk of loss and damage caused by weather extremes is a relevant part of the business model. So insurance companies have to pay for that, so they have to know about the local hazards uh, and uh, they need uh, data on them and so therefore we are very grateful to NASA and uh, WMO and all the agencies uh, who provide uh, uh, these data of the different weather-related uh, perils. If hazards are changing, and unfortunately they are, uh, like for example due to climate change, uh, uh, insurers need to quantify these trends and build them into uh, their risk models. In order to be able to assess uh, risk properly, insurers also need in-house knowledge, and uh, this uh, has uh, been the case or the cause that uh, insurers have started to recruit natural scientists already back in the 1970s. Reinsurers already for many decades uh, have considered global warming as a risk of change, so they have uh, addressed this in the case of Munich Re already in 1973 in a publication by Munich Re, you can read about this. Today also global primary insurers, the large insurers uh, like uh, AXA, Allianz or others have uh, departments with natural scientists uh, analyzing weather hazards and insurers have created their own data bases on weather-related loss events. And I want to share some of this information now. So insurers are data providers and by communicating these data also can help to raise awareness uh, of changing risks. I will want to show you the example of the Munich Re NATCAT service database. Uh, Swiss Re has the Sigma database, and there is the NDAT database at the University of Louvain uh, in, in, in Belgium. Uh, the Munich Re NATCAT service database is the most comprehensive database uh, currently documenting more than 41,000 uh, individual extreme events, uh, natural disasters uh, since 1980. Uh, the Munich Re data is uh, complete, uh, so we think uh, uh, there is a complete picture of what has happened on this globe. Just to show you uh, what, what is covered, uh, these are all the events covered uh, for last year, 2017, which has been the record year of weather-related losses. Uh, total losses of natural disasters have reached 330 uh, billion uh, US dollars. Uh, we have seen these uh, three hurricanes, Harvey, Irma, Maria. Harvey uh, has caused the second largest losses after Katrina, uh, and uh, the other two hurricanes have uh, caused the fourth and fifth largest losses. So just in one year, uh, we have three of the five most expensive hurricanes uh, uh, in, in history. The different colors here show the different peril families, red dots mark uh, earthquakes, volcano eruptions, and uh, tsunamis, so these are the geophysical hazards. Then green are all kinds of storms, blue floods, 
and uh, orange or yellow are other weather-related uh, disasters like uh, uh, wildfires uh, or uh, heat waves. Here you see the distribution of the different uh, perils. Uh, left uh, top is on to the number of the events, and you clearly see that uh, most of the events, 91% of all events, are weather-related, have been weather-related since 1980. Uh, you see 80% uh, of the overall losses uh, have been weather-related, not geophysically uh, related, and 90% uh, uh, of the insured losses. So uh, it's very important for insurers to know what's happening in the atmosphere because 90% uh, of the nat natural catastrophe losses come out of the atmosphere. And things are changing, this is for true. Here you see the trend of loss relevant events since 1980, and you see they have about tripled the number of events. If you just look at the red bars, the geophysical events, you don't see such a trend. They have some variation from year to year, which is a natural thing, but they don't show this trend upwards. So the trend of natural disasters uh, upwards is driven uh, almost only by the weather-related uh, uh, events. And, as already said, we have seen the record uh, losses last year, 2017, uh, with more than uh, 300 uh, billion US dollars, 330 billion US dollars. The green bars are the total losses, the blue bars are the insured losses, and all of these values have been adjusted already for inflation, so you don't find inflation here anymore. The second most expensive uh, year still is 2005 with uh, hurricanes uh, Katrina, Wilma, and uh, Rita. Insurance loss data also provide uh, some complementing information, for example, for small-scale events which are not covered by the weather stations, for example. But if you have a loss event caused by hail, you know there has been hail at a certain location, so it's complementing data. Here you see the a number of loss-relevant convective storms in Europe. Convective means thunderstorm-related uh, events. Uh, and you see also there has been a, a significant increase in the number of, uh, of these events. Uh, they can cause losses ca uh, because of hail, because of intense precipitation, uh, because of uh, the formation of tornadoes or flash floods, uh, because of that uh, intense precipitation. And interestingly, the losses have increased significantly. Here are the convective storm losses in Europe. Here you have an additional information. You have, besides the nominal losses, which are the losses at the time of the event, and the, the uh, inflation-adjusted losses, the green line, also the normalized losses, which means uh, here the changing exposure, changing wealth, changing number of people affected is considered. And this is the best uh, for comparison of uh, historical losses with current losses. But even if you have a look at these uh, normalized losses, the red curve, you see that especially during the last 10, 15 years, we had a significant increase in these normalized losses, which cannot be explained anymore by social demographic changes. They only can be explained on the hazard side, so something must have changed. Just uh, two examples of such extreme events here in Europe, thunderstorm-related loss events in May uh, two years ago in, in Germany, in Baden-Württemberg and uh, Bavaria, causing losses of uh, 2.5 uh, billion euros, especially caused by uh, flash floods. And the other example is from the Netherlands, uh, also from the year 2016, also a billion euro loss event, especially caused by hail, uh, which has destroyed greenhouses uh, there in, in, in the Netherlands. And interestingly, on the day of this storm, the highest ever measured absolute humidity in the Netherlands has been recorded with a dew point of 25 degrees Celsius. Where does this humidity come from? And there is evidence that we have more water vapor in the atmosphere. Here you see uh, the results of a study which has investigated the specific humidity, which is a measure for absolute humidity, 
uh, and uh, wherever you see these blue colors, there has been a trend upwards. Uh, there is more humidity almost all around the globe in the Northern Hemisphere. You can find this trend, and the trend is driven as the Secretary General also has addressed uh, in his introductory uh, speech uh, because of rising sea surface temperatures. So the oceans have warmed up as well as uh, the atmosphere, and if you have warmer surfaces, water surfaces, you have more evaporation. This is pure physics. Uh, and uh, we see that in uh, all of the ocean basins here, uh, it's the tropical parts of them, that these uh, sea surface temperatures have risen. And this is the reason why more evaporation takes place. Uh, the atmosphere is warming uh, and can take up more uh, water vapor as well. So there is a higher potential for more energy in the weather machine, in the weather system, but also uh, higher potential for uh, intense precipitation because there is more water to uh, come out of the atmosphere. Munich Re uh, and all other uh, leading reinsurers have a, a history of sharing uh, the data with uh, the society and research community and uh, there is a relatively new tool, it's uh, about one year old now, which has been launched by Munich Re. Uh, you see the, the internet address uh, which you have to, to, to address and uh, then you get to this tool, you don't have to register and it's totally free. Uh, so if you go there, you find this uh, first screen and what you then can do is to access uh, large parts of this uh, NAVCAT service database of the lost database of uh, natural disasters. Uh, the first thing you can do, you can switch between observation period. The longest period you can choose is 1980 to 2017 now. Uh, but you can also choose a single year. Then you can select the input data, the perils. You can select, uh, for example, tropical storms, convective storms, or uh, wildfires. Uh, uh, then you can select the different regions and uh, can filter uh, in uh, respect to socioeconomic criteria, for example, income group of countries or things like that. And then you have to decide what kind of analysis you want to do. You can do number statistics, which means how of uh, how frequent things have happened. You can see the loss statistics in the nominal inflation adjusted and normalized uh, way and can have distribution tables and maps like the map you see in, in the background. And then you can uh, download uh, the results uh, in a PDF format which you can use in a publication or in a presentation or share it uh, through the social media. So this is uh, what, what this tool uh, provides uh, to uh, research community but to everybody who wants to use that. And uh, the insurers also do own and collaborative uh, research uh, uh, and by this uh, thing, uh, we also contribute uh, to increase knowledge on, on weather extremes. So, for example, the Swiss primary insurer, the Mobiliar, uh, has uh, uh, created a lab for climate risks and natural hazards in the Oeschger Center for Climate Research in Bern, here in Switzerland. AXA, the AXA Research Fund uh, sponsors a chair at uh, the Key IT uh, Institute in Karlsruhe for research on extratropical storms. There is a cooperation between Tokyo uh, Millennium uh, Insurance Company and also the Key IT uh, in, in Karlsruhe on hail risk modeling. Uh, there is a sponsoring of uh, Philipp Klotzbach uh, at Colorado State University who does the hurricane forecasts uh, and this is sponsored by Ironshore Insurance and Insurance Information uh, Institute. Uh, there is sponsoring of the Barcelona Supercomputing Center for analysis of hurricane forecasts by XL Insurance Company and there has been also a cooperation between Munich Re, German Weather Service and uh, the University in Berlin on a project to create an event set on extra tropical storms. So quite, quite a variety of research. And there has been a large study in Germany which has been sponsored by the German Association of Insurers, uh, which has been uh, 
done together with the Potsdam Institute on Climate Impact Research, the University of Berlin and University in Cologne, to model future losses for Germany, future property losses caused by climate change. And just an example of the results is the expected increases in property losses uh, in the next, uh, in, in the time uh, between 2011 and 2014, so in the 30 years uh, in, in which, uh, which we already have started, 25% uh, increase on average is estimated for summer storms and 61% uh, uh, in this next time slice, uh, uh, 2041 to 2070. And uh, even uh, uh, some Colleagues uh, from the insurance industry have published uh, peer-reviewed papers together with uh, PhD students uh, who worked uh, in these uh, uh, natural disaster insurance departments, like for example this where we have analyzed rising variability in thunderstorm-related U.S. losses as a reflection of changes in large-scale thunderstorm forcing. This has been published in uh, the Journal of the American Meteorological Society. Insurance uh, itself uh, increases resilience of economies and societies. What does it mean? If there is a high insurance penetration, this helps the national economies uh, to recover after a big shock. There have been three studies, and you see the citations here of these three studies, uh, which have analyzed economic performance of national economies after large extreme events. And they have uh, compared countries with different insurance penetration, different insurance densities. And all of these three studies have found that uh, uh, the higher the insurance penetration has been, uh, the better the economies were off after the extreme events. In some cases, even uh, insurance, uh, the, 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 the f effect of insurance has been that uh, the, the dip of the GDP after such an extreme event uh, could be compensated or even overcompensated because a lot of money uh, flows into the economies, like for example after Katrina, where a lot of the losses had been insured. So a lot of money uh, goes into the construction industry and this boosts uh, uh, even uh, the, the economy. And there is another factor which is quite interesting, that uh, there is more and more so-called parametric insurance. This works just with simple triggers, weather triggers. So you need to have weather data to uh, build the insurance uh, models to figure out uh, how probable a certain level of uh, precipitation or wind is, and therefore you need weather stations. So uh, the increasing demand of these parametric uh, insurance systems increases also the demand for weather stations. And uh, the, one of the largest uh, projects uh, which has been started uh, a few years ago in 2015 at the G7 summit in, in Germany, where the G7 countries have decided uh, to set up, uh, to initiate a project for climate insurance, climate change insurance for the very poor people. So the target group is that uh, within five years, 400 million additional people get some basic insurance cover against uh, weather extremes. So this is a real ambitious thing. And the target group is the real poor uh, who have a daily income of less than uh, $2. Uh, this is on the road. There is a secretariat uh, which has been uh, been started uh, in Bonn, and uh, hopefully uh, these uh, targets uh, will be will be reached. The G7 governments have given uh, 670 million by now U.S. dollars uh, to this uh, project, and uh, most of the new insurance products will be parametric. Uh, which is, as already said, uh, based on the de definition of triggers of meteorological parameters. Uh, here is uh, uh, an example that uh, here 20 automated weather stations uh, uh, have been uh, erected, have been built up uh, to help Ethiopia to launch weather insurance. So insurance can be a driver even to get a, a, a better uh, 
better scaling in, in meteorological stations. More than 10 years ago, uh, insurers together with uh, non-governmental organizations and uh, scientists have founded a non-profit think tank, the Munich Climate Insurance Initiative, which is hosted at the United Nations University uh, in Bonn. And uh, uh, we have brought in uh, into the climate negotiations some some suggestions how insurance related mechanisms could help uh, people in developing countries to better adapt uh, to uh, climate uh, change and uh, as you all know uh, the Paris Agreement uh, has taken up uh, part of uh, these ideas besides the, the emission reductions you all know about uh, this two degree limit and uh, even aiming for 1.5 degree and uh, you know about uh, the commitment of the industrialized countries uh, to uh, make available 100 billion dollars per year starting in 2020 which would be a good basis for example to uh, provide some su subsidies for these insurance related uh, mechanisms besides these things also climate insurance has been a, a big topic in in paris the warsaw international mechanism for loss and damage uh, introduced already at COP19 uh, was decided to uh, should that it should be further investigated and uh, organized uh, that climate related losses and damages are acknowledgeable uh, as a third a pillar besides adaptation and uh, and mitigation and insurance is considered as an essential part to uh, to address uh, loss and damage and it's referenced in a uh, paragraph 49 and article 8 in the agreement so you can read about insurance there and also the insurance uh, are insurers are supporting UNISDR uh, in in uh, many ways in a in a private sector uh, in a private sector alliance which is has the name arise and uh, there the insurance workstream has uh, committed itself to provide natural catastrophe data to provide uh, vulnerability data which can be derived from the loss uh, data and the meteorologic data and sharing expert knowledge on loss prevention and a certain percentage of investments insurers are also large investors as you know uh, should go to risk reducing uh, activities uh, insurers support also research uh, to become less vulnerable weather ready uh, which is the slogan also of this uh, this uh, event here uh, insurers have uh, given the money to uh, initiate a research institute which is located in South Carolina which is the insurance institute for business and home safety they have one of the world's largest wind tunnels there you see the fans on the left side and uh, on the right side you see uh, you can have a look inside this wind tunnel is big enough to put whole houses into a storm and test different building materials and this is done for example in a nice video here you see the uh, the, the the link to that uh, and what what they have done in this uh, experiment they have put two similar almost equal houses next to each other in the right house they have invested just five percent more to build it uh, less vulnerable to fix the roof in a better way etc and after both houses have been applied with wind velocities of 160 kilometers per hour the right the house on the right hand side is still standing there with hardly any damage and the other house is totally gone five percent difference in uh, investment and I think uh, this can help us to uh, become less vulnerable even though the uh, the hazards are increasing uh, due to climate change and uh, the experience of these these tests has, has gone even into a, an app uh, which has been uh, been uh, provided by Munich we and uh, this uh, Institute IBHS where uh, people who want to build a house or want to fortify uh, a house uh, can can learn what they can do with little money with little extra money to make the house less vulnerable 
Yeah, uh, Secretary General, you have shown this uh, already, so I don't have to explain this. Uh, insurers are risk managers. Risk is the major part of the business model of insurers, and if the global economists uh, tell us that the largest risks currently are extreme weather events, natural disasters, and also the failure of climate change mitigation and adaptation, this means that insurers have to have an eye on that and have to care for that, uh, care for the proper covers, uh, care for the uh, risk adequate premiums, and uh, also uh, care for uh, making our societies less vulnerable in this uh, uh, respect. So, to sum up, uh, the insurance industry definitely is affected by extreme weather events in its core business by sharing data and communicating about uh, these things uh, raises uh, the awareness to changing weather risk by communicating uh, these things and uh, insurers uh, provide complementing data on weather extremes, especially on the small scale ones, uh, which may perhaps uh, be not uh, documented by the measuring network and uh, insurers contribute uh, to close the gaps in the MET station networks and contribute to extreme weather and resilience research. Thank you very much for your interest and uh, I don't know whether we have uh, the chance afterwards uh, to go into a discussion. I would be happy uh, to answer questions or to listen to your remarks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Hopper. We now are going to cross the Atlantic again for a presentation from uh, Ms. Ada Monzon. Ada Monzon joined us, sorry, joined the U.S. National Weather Service Forecast Office in San Juan in eight, 1989 and has won many awards during her 30 years career. She's Puerto Rico's best known weather anchor and chief meteorologist. She was Google top search person in Puerto Rico in 2017. And most important, the voice of reassurance at the island, as the island was hit by Hurricane Maria, the most devastating storm in its modern history. She won a standing ovation at the American Meteorological Society annual meeting and was recently named 2018 National Weather Person of the Year for her contribution to public safety and disaster resilience. In 2010, she founded a nonprofit organization, Eco Exploratorio, which is the Science Museum of Puerto Rico, as a catalyst for science, technology, engineering, and math education on the island. Ms. Manzan, please, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much. Good afternoon, Secretary General and colleagues at the World Meteorological Organization in Vienna, Switzerland. Muy buenas tardes. It's a privilege to share the story of Puerto Rico as it recovers from Hurricane Maria, which devastated our island on September 20th 2017, exactly six months ago, and this is the most catastrophic national disaster in our modern history. Maria was a category four hurricane with sustained winds of 155 miles per hour and higher gusts, and is the most devastating tropical cyclone that has affected Puerto Rico in almost 100 years. It is estimated that there are more than $90 billion in damages, and according to authorities, it has been the most logistically challenging national disaster in the United States' modern history, or as FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, indicated the largest federal response to a national disaster. The eye of the hurricane crossed from southeast to northwest our 100 by 35 mile island in the Eastern Caribbean. In a terrifying eight hour journey with a tropical storm and hurricane winds combined, prevailing for 25 
to 30 hours. The last time we had such an intense hurricane was in 1928. As you can see in the satellite images, the eye, as it was coming in through the southeast, it was going on an um, outer wall replacement cycle. So it changed from a category five to a category four, losing just two miles per hour, and then it changed a category. But as it was interacting with the mountainous region, we lost the shape of the eye wall and the eye although we do not lose the eye as it was crossing the island from southeast through, ninth, through northwest. Unfortunately, we lost almost all the way in Iraq. And the highest winds in the island were 137 miles per hour in the island of Culebra. But most wind damage occurred in southeast Puerto Rico during main landfall and in the municipalities located in the mountain range. Bear in mind that almost about 75% of Puerto Rico's land area consists of hills or mountains, with a maximum altitude of 4,383 feet. So winds at these altitudes were like category five. These were the last images that we have from the Doppler radar, which we lost when the eye wall or, this, or the outer eye wall was moving through Puerto Rico. Look at some of these images of the wind across the island. The visibilities, the sound, how can we forget the sound of the wind? All the power authority transmission towers, television, radio, and communication towers are located in the mountains. And as I told you, 137 miles per hour was the only complete record that we have in the eastern part of the island in gusts. Unfortunately, we lost most of our stations. We did this special uh, study with the University of Puerto Rico my campus at the University of Notre Dame with funds from the National Science Foundation, and we're still studying the engineering aspects of the devastation that Hurricane Maria produced. For example, look at these pictures in the landfall site. This is what is called I'm sorry, can I, Ada, can you hear us? Yes. You need to share yes. the slides for us to be able to see them. Can oh, you I'm share so the sorry. slides? Please, yes. Okay, let's see. Can you can you see them now? Uh, no. Just just wait a minute. It should come. It says you're sharing, so. No. Okay, maybe. Okay. All right then. Can you try it again, maybe? Yes. Please. Can you see it now? Okay. I, okay. For some reason, it's not coming. Maybe continue your presentation, and it'll it'll come later. I'm sorry. Thank you. Uh, but are you look? Are you are you seeing me? For now? Yes, yes, we see you, no problem, but uh, when you change to the slides, we, you, we remain on your image. So we're hearing and seeing you fine, but we're not seeing the images that you're trying to send us. So sorry, because it says that I'm sharing Microsoft PowerPoint. Yeah. Oh, well, it's just a failure of the technology. Please keep on going. Sorry for the interruption. No problem. So, um, all the power authority transmission towers, television, um, radio communication towers that are located in the mountains, unfortunately, they were 
gone of the National Weather Service Doppler radar, which were located at 2,900 feet. The antenna plate and the dome were torn apart from the pedestal and thrown and scattered 500 feet south of the power. Our television station tower, located in the same area, was 1,000 feet high. It was torn to pieces. And the 6 to 12-inch tension cables that were used to hold the tower were severed that began to lash and rip the main building. More than 75% of the trees lost their foliage, and about 50% of them were uprooted. Home trees, especially at the landfill, uh, at the landfill site, were snapped, torn, and even some of them found a way to fly. What most of our colleagues feel is that a huge tornado, EF3, EF4, went through Puerto Rico. The rainfall amounts were highest in the east central part of the island. The National Weather Service reports 38 inches in two days. And as you can imagine, with these amounts of rains, there were severe floods, some rivers reached the peak discharges, and there were many slides. The highest storm surge is estimated between 6 to 9 feet. The most direct damages were observed in structures that were not built according to code. Windows and doors that were not hurricane resistant, structures in the elevated terrain that were not built to sustain more of these intense winds, and the majority of people spent the hurricane inside a bathroom or a closet. It is estimated now that more than 400,000 households out of around 1,200,000 were totally or partially destroyed. In some communities, approximately 80 to 90 percent of the homes were severely damaged. It has only approved less than 40 percent of the 1 million individual disaster funding applications because most people that have damages do not have the deeds to their homes. So we need more than $90 million to rebuild, and federal funding approved has been $60 million. So our island was ravaged by Maria. We lost all the essential services, electricity, water, communications, access to ports, food, fuel, and desperation was part of our lives. Officially, at least 64 people died, but this number is being reviewed since other entities have informed the possibility of more than 1,000 indirect deaths. There was a period where people were on their own, with their neighbors surviving, and understanding the full scale of the devastation and the magnitude of the disaster took time. Because without communication, it was almost impossible to orchestrate the logistics to access fuel, to access food, water, and perform the rescue operation. It was further complicated by flooding, damaged roads, destroyed bridges, mudslides, trees, electric poles, and all kinds of debris, which blocked many all the roads. This has been the most challenging situation that we have ever faced, and all of us suffered a period of instability and emotional distress. The lack of services fueled a mass exodus of people from Puerto Rico to the United States. More than 135,000 people have left Puerto Rico. 40% of them have settled in Florida. Foundations, nonprofit organizations, church department, the community have worked very hard to restart Puerto Rico. And we are very grateful to those who have helped us from around the world for the past six months. As of today, stores have foods, there's fuel. We don't need to do the lines to get fuel or go to the bank. Hotels and businesses are back in, in business. But still, it's very hard to restart Puerto Rico. And, you know, there's still at least 10% of the population that continues without service, electrical service, especially in rural areas 
and at the landfill site toward the southeast region of Puerto Rico. There are serious economic and social challenges that we are still addressing. You know, Maria is still part of our lives. Every day, we talk about the hurricane, not once, many times a day, because everything we see, everything we hear, everything we touch has been affected by Maria. The recovery effort has been slow and very hard, and still today, many people are struggling and they have not received the help they need to recover. Before the hurricane, our economy was struggling and the infrastructure system was weak. Puerto Rico has declared bankruptcy under Chapter 3. The economic situation was deeply affecting how everyone prepared. In addition, most people underestimated the strength of this hurricane and believed that not much was going to happen as had occurred with Irma two weeks before Maria. And in addition, people did not believe that current hurricane category five was coming our way. This was all a recipe for a disaster. The severity of Hurricane Maria brought a collapse in Puerto Rico that like we have never experienced in our lifetime. I should emphasize that our forecast and the message delivery was almost perfect, almost invented. There was a consistent message between the National Gate Center, the National Weather Service, and the media. I th think we all did a magnificent job. I think I didn't get it myself and all my communication resources to get the message out through radio, television, newspapers, social media. Every three hours I was doing a Facebook Live or a Twitter Live that had over 31 million views in the month of September. But even with all this communication work and meteorology, we could not avoid the immense consequences of this hurricane in our island. But the forecast, the media, and the government mobilization save lives. Still today, we are working very hard to do the best we can and to endure the worst of Maria. And in less than three months, we will be facing another active hurricane season. There are still many needs. The recovery in some areas is not fast enough, and the funding assigned is not enough. We survived Maria, but there are still serious challenges. Enduring two major hurricanes has been hard, but at the same time, he has served a vast lesson to our society. We need to find a way of living with natural disasters and climate change, or tackling them, and we need to work harder as meteorologists as scientists to educate our public through all means of communication, especially social media. This strong hurricane has exposed many weaknesses at various levels, but there are unique opportunities to execute innovation, mitigation strategies, and tools for national disaster resilience about on our society. As a forecaster, and emphasizing her education, mitigation, preparedness through my entire career, as much of you as much of you have done in your lifetime. It is very frustrating to see what happened in Puerto Rico. It has been painful to watch, but I am very satisfied that our forecast and education effort saved us. We're still struggling, but we are resilient. And there are things we can control, there are things we cannot control. But I think that today, most people value that we need to be self-sufficient in the face of disasters, that we are in this together. We're never alone, never, ever alone. And no matter what nature brings, we are getting weather ready for the next hurricane season and better educated in our communities 
for sea level rise, for coastal erosion, for coastal destruction, from severe weather storms in the Atlantic that bring all these swell events like what we just had recently, groundwater inundation that we are looking at right now in Puerto Rico, threats to our ecosystems, I think that we are becoming climate smart. And for the first time, we are opening the doors for renewable energy. Puerto Rico has changed. It has been transformed. But we cannot, we cannot underestimate the value of education and partnerships. As you heard at the beginning, I'm the founder of the Exploratorium Science Museum. And we are working with national disaster experts, with climate change experts in Puerto Rico, to bring the science to the public so that they start preparing for June 1st. Thank you very much. I am really sorry that I did not see the slides, but I am very grateful that you allow me to, the, to bring this message to the world that we are, we are committed to making Puerto Rico stronger and better. And this is not a, the work of one person, it's the work of all of us. We are this little island in the Caribbean, but we are full of hope full of heart, and we cannot wait to make more uh, uh, partnerships with you at the World Meteorological Organization. Happy Meteorological Day. Be weather ready and climate smart. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Ada Monzon. Uh, now we will move to uh, watching a short video on drought.
we now invite a statement from the floor. I would like to begin with Mr. Albert Matis, permanent representative of Curaçao with WMO. Mr. Matis. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I would like also to um, congratulate WMO with the World Meteorological Organization and also as a member, I feel that uh, we are doing the utmost best to help the world understand what is about uh, this day but also how we're celebrating each year with a very good team. And I think this year, again, is very good, nice one, that uh, we have to keep working uh, with this team every year again, because it's very important. What I would like to mention is, uh, uh, as the permanent representative of Curacao and St. Martin, our um, sister island, St. Martin, was also severely hit by a hurricane. It was Hurricane Irma. Uh, it was actually an extreme dangerous Category 5 hurricane with winds from 185 miles an hour and uh, with higher gusts. Also, storm surge was a life-threatening storm surge we had there from 7 to 11 feet at that time. And rainfall, we had about 8 to 12 inches. That's about 200 to 300 millimeters. So all those are the effects uh, coming from uh, Hurricane Irma. Mm. One thing is actually uh, that it strikes us is that uh, uh, in 95, we had Hurricane Louise as a Category 3. But this time, we had uh, a Category 5. And as you can see on the picture, that is actually on uh, um, September 6th at uh, 7, uh, 7 o'clock or 7.15. That was the time. And there you can see the uh, hurricane and the eye of it. And you can see there that uh, the island of St. Martin is exposed, but also the neighboring island of uh, Anguilla. So that is what you can imagine what happened during the, those uh, hours. After the hurricane, there was no communication. So as we are uh, in the Dutch Kingdom, our, the sister island of Curaçao, we start working on a relief team to help St. Martin out. And the government of Curaçao has set up that team. What you can see is actually one of the most beautiful hotels on the island, but only the um, construction is still there, but never, nothing else. Everything was damaged due to the wind, due to the water. There's no glasses at the hotel. So after two or three days, this is again a picture that you can see about the storm surge. This is normally where, where all the tourists will go and have a beautiful day. And now we have ships just on that area. So those are the effects that we have seen. Cars on the beach. Uh, you can see how it was stripped by the wind. And so those are the things that you can imagine happened on that island. So immediately after the, um, uh, those days, uh, the king of the kingdom of the Netherlands also said, OK, He's coming to Curaçao, and uh, he, he was briefed by the Met Service at that time. And uh, uh, there is where he show us that, as a king, he also would like to be involved. And that's something very beautiful that we saw from the king. And after uh, I have briefed him about uh, the Hurricane Irma, he took off and uh, went to St. Martin to look with his own eyes, what was actually the, um, the impact of the uh, hurricane. So, and that is actually uh, the most important part of what happened. The communication from the Prime Minister office to all the uh, community on the island went very well. Uh, his communication was also the same as we could see in one of the video of uh, Ms. Peters about the forecaster 
trying to tell everyone they, have, they should leave the smaller islands. And that was actually the same message the Prime Minister uh, have informed everyone uh, during, uh, before the passage of uh, um, Irma. So regarding the, the forecast, the communication of the forecast, it went well. But still, you had a lot of people at large during the period. So that's why it was very important at the time to have uh, a very good cooperation between the government of St. Martin and that of Curacao. So in that sense, uh, we started working together with them. I myself went uh, uh, a week later to St. Martin to set up an assessment uh, team and also to work on that. So the first thing is actually when something happened to an island like that is the two ports. The airport should be open as soon as possible, but also the harbor should, as, should open as possible. So those are the, were the two most important tasks. And uh, the Met Service, as the Met Service Authority, we could put an AWOS there so we could start the commercial flights again. In that sense, uh, um, it was very well um, accompanied by all the people themselves of St. Martin who helped us doing it, and still they are working uh, together with us. But also one thing they said, the Prime Minister of St. Martin said is actually, we have to build, but now we have to build better. And that is actually the direction where they are heading. Uh, and I think, uh, again, for this year, we will be probably have, again, a um, active season. So we have to com continue as a group, because I think uh, the Hurricane Committee of the Regional Association for the Caribbean and uh, Central America and North America is doing a good job. So that is where we have to keep working in this sense. And I'm very happy that WMO is also providing us uh, that kind of coordination among the countries that we can keep facing uh, every hurricane season again, that we know that we have friends not only in the region, but also outside the region. I thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Martis. We are running a little bit behind, but I uh, still uh, would like to invite uh, Ms. Caroline rodriguez Birkert, uh, Director of our li Liaison Office with UNOC, to take the floor. See, is she here? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Actually, my director has other commitments. She, she, she left the room just like uh, about half an hour ago. So uh, my name is Willia Kim. I am the Natural Resources Officer based in the FAO Geneva. And uh, first of all, on, be, uh, on behalf of uh, our Director General, Mr. Jose Graziano da Silva, we would like to uh, convey his best wishes. And he sent his regard to, to uh, Mr. Talas and co all colleagues distinguished colleagues in the room and uh, uh, he would like to send his apology because he could not be here today due to other commitments that he could not avoid and uh, FAO would like to thank WMO for the excellence and long-standing collaboration in the areas of agricultural meteorology, desertification, climate services and natural drought policies and many other issues of common concerns and we are very pleased to, to lead the compilation of the input to the chapter on climate risk and related impact for the WMO statement on the state of the global climate in, in 2017, which is launched today. And also thanks to other colleagues who, who contribute to, to, to these chapters. And uh, Mr. Chair, um, as, as, you, as we just have watched the, uh, the video just now that drought has, has a significant impact and uh, FAO has just released uh, our report uh, just last week, the, the new report on the impact on disasters, the impact of a disaster and crisis on food security and agriculture. And in that report, it, uh, it highlights that uh, about agriculture sectors absorb about 26% of all uh, uh, 
total economic loss in uh, when it comes to uh, climate related uh, hazard so meaning that uh, when it comes to drought itself the figure raised up to 80 percent so there's a need to really uh, giving more voice to to silent disasters such as drought so um We, we, at FAO, we, we are working to, to invest in data analysis, information, and early warning systems. And uh, we also provide technical support for an in innovative early warning and early actions in, in many uh, disaster-prone countries. And uh, we would like to emphasize that FAO looks forward to, to strengthening collaboration with WMO and other partners on joint projects of mutual interest and also for other related areas. And finally, we, uh, we would like to, 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 to commit that FAO will continue to work with the UN agencies such as WMO and others and development partner to support member countries in implementing the adopted global agendas, including the SDGs, the Paris Agreement, and the Sendai Framework as part of our collective effort to eradicate hunger and poverty. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you very, thank you very much. Um, I would like to call uh, Mr. Ivan Chasik, the former president of uh, Regional Association Six, to say a few words. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it is really my privilege and honor uh, to uh, uh, congratulate to all of us uh, World Meteorological Day and also uh, uh, my, my congratulations to the, to the WMO Secretary General and all WMO Secretariat and staff uh, and of course members. Uh, I would like to convey just a little story uh, because you now we are in, in a time constraint uh, story in, in my country that is not older than two weeks. Uh, it is about uh, uh, two extreme uh, events that starts uh, with a drop of temperature up to minus 20 degrees, uh, then uh, with a severe wind that exceeds 100 and 150 kilometers per hour uh, during, at the Adriatic coast, and then a snowfall that in two days rises from half a meter to two meters, uh, particularly in the mountain areas that connects um, uh, interior of Croatia with, the, with this Adriatic part and close uh, uh, the, co the communication. So uh, I, I would say that uh, seven days ago uh, uh, forecast was, was so good that uh, all state administration from uh, the municipalities to, to, to regional uh, uh, government and also uh, the state government, including Prime Minister, already were engaged in, in these events. And this didn't stop. After uh, a week and a half, temperature rises up to plus 20 degrees, 15 to, to 20 degrees, and then there was a warning of, of melting of snow together with a uh, moderate rain, but still uh, severe in this uh, situation, and also announcing of floods. Uh, and then there was improvisation uh, of uh, barriers at the rivers, uh, even when the snow was there, before flooding uh, uh, appeared, uh, uh, so that uh, uh, actually uh, one only severe uh, thing was a landslides just uh, uh, crashing uh, uh, a part of a town in, in, in the mountainous uh, region of, of Croatia, where of course there was no help, but nobody was killed and uh, people uh, was taking care on, on that. And I can ask uh, really a question, what will really happen if, if this uh, uh, meteorological and also hydrological information was not there? And really, we could speak about billion, at least billion of euros. So it's a really a success story of uh, weather-ready uh, uh, creations and also creation National Meteorological Service together with the civil protection and all uh, Red Cross, uh, then also creation army, uh, Minister of Interior, Minister of I Environment. And it is interesting that we have built uh, excellent relation with the civil protection, with the state directorate of uh, 
the disaster rescue and, and protection uh, just nearly 15 years ago with a team building at the Adriatic coast that last three days we know each other by the names and it really lasts all these years uh, that uh, a telephone call was very important signal of course besides all measures and also uh, it, it was well coordinated with the media with the state television and also other private private television. So I think it's really a nice story that is very recent one I want to share with you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, last but, but not least, on my list I have Mr. Siem <coughs> Cheng from the Hong Kong Observatory to take the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my name is Siem Cheng from Hong Kong. Um, it's really my privilege to share some of the uh, experience in Hong Kong. Um, as you know, Hong Kong is a coastal city, and just like other coastal cities, we are prone to the effect of tropical cyclone every year. And last year is a particular year we have uh, eight times where we have to issue tropical cyclone warning signals. And among them, we have five times where we have to really close down the city due to the high winds and also the, the, uh, um, the, the, uh, the floodings. And among them, uh, I would like to mention one. Uh, this is uh, caused by Super Typhoon uh, Hato. Uh, Super Typhoon is on the highest category of a uh, tropical cyclone. And uh, at that time, it came quite close to Hong Kong. And uh, really, we have to uh, issue the highest tropical cyclone signal in Hong Kong. And before then, uh, we were quite worried that uh, it will bring a lot of uh, damages and also uh, loss of life to Hong Kong. But eventually, very luckily, uh, there was no loss of life and the impact to Hong Kong can be considered as quite minimal. And uh, we look back, uh, one important thing is to get through uh, warnings and also impact related information to the uh, government as well as to the public is very important. And uh, nowadays, of course, uh, we rely on a number of uh, different channels to get through uh, to our uh, government and also to the public. And uh, of course now, apart from uh, TV or radio, we can also make use of a website and also smartphones. And uh, I would like to mention a bit about smartphone. Uh, in our case, we have uh, developed a mobile app uh, several years ago, and uh, up till now, we have around about uh, 6 million downloads, but uh, in Hong Kong, our population is uh, 7.4 million, so quite a large majority of people is making use of the mobile app, and we consider that as a very effective means to reach out to the uh, public. And uh, talking about impact-based uh, information is very important. Uh, in the past, when we issue high warning signals, tropical cyclone signal, uh, some people, definitely some people, will go to the shore just to watch the high waves, which is very dangerous. And uh, this time, when uh, Hato came to Hong Kong, and uh, we make use of every channels to warn people that uh, Hong Kong may experience serious flooding due to the uh, storm surges. And in fact, uh, quite some part of Hong Kong is uh, flooded, and uh, one village has to be evacuated. Uh, but uh, no people were hurt and no people get healed, and which is quite fortunate. And uh, I just look at the uh, theme of this year, and I like the word smart. We need to rely on smart technologies, uh, of course not just smartphone, uh, just to enrich ourselves, to enrich our capability, to become more resilient to um, you know, the effect of uh, severe weather. And uh, through educating the public, we hope that uh, people can get smarter, more resilient, and hopefully to reduce the uh, full effect and also the threat of uh, tropical cyclone and other severe weather. So that's all from me. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so, Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, we have now concluded the official part of our celebration. As you leave the hall, we encourage you to look at the photographs which were finalists uh, in the WMO Weather uh, Ready Climate Smart Photo Competition. Before I leave the floor to the Secretary General for his closing remark, I would like to inform you that uh, we have those um, umbrella around. They are a deal for you today for 35 francs, Swiss francs. 
You may need it when you, you walk out of here. <laughs> <laughs> Secretary General, <laughs> the floor is yours. Thank you, Abdullah. So, so he has made a new forecast, so it's, it, was, <laughs> it was a little bit opposite to my forecast. <clears throat> Anyhow, uh, I think that we have heard very impressive stories uh, from, uh, from various parts of the world, and, 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 and luckily we have also heard that we are, in most cases, we have been weather ready. But, uh, but uh, once these extremes are becoming more extreme, it's, it's difficult to cope with them. That's, that, that's obvious. And, uh, and this climate uh, smart uh, part means that we have to uh, be prepared, and, 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 and this adaptation means that the Professor Hoppe was uh, showing in his uh, presentation that's one way. But also we have to start implementation of the Paris Agreement. That's, uh, that's for sure, sure the message from, from today. Uh, I would like to thank uh, uh, these interventions that we just uh, heard recently and, and, and these uh, stories also from Puerto Rico. I think that they were all very impressive and, uh, and I would like to thank uh, Professor Hoppe for his uh, excellent uh, presentation, professional presentation and, and, and your dimension was very, very interesting uh, also for us. And, and uh, you. since you are uh, dealing with the finance sector, the message from finance sector is also highly, highly important. And, and Jill, thanks once again for joining us, and uh, thanks for being long-term friend of uh, WMO. So, so let's continue our great uh, cooperation. And thanks for, thanks for coming today, and thanks for the audience. Uh, uh, I think that you have, uh, you have uh, without you, uh, this this event wouldn't have been a success story. And uh, and, and thanks for the interpreters for for translating. Uh, things to French language as well. It's very, very much appreciated. Uh, so after these little bit melancholic uh, stories, I think that it's time to okay. enjoy the uh, the beautiful weather outdoors. Although Abdullah may have uh, <laughs> different op <laughs> opinions, so be, to be sure, buy one umbrella if if, if I'm I'm, I'm wrong. <laughs> and and upstairs uh, you can enjoy the gourmet food uh, prepared by. Our excellent staff, and, um, and, and I would like to promise you that there's also very good company upstairs. So please join us uh, upstairs, and uh, thanks for coming.